What up, everybody? What's good? It's your boy, BQ. This is the Impact Lounge, the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. And this is the Cool Factor Podcast. I am not only your host for this episode, I am the co-host as well. Going solo for this episode, reviewing Impact Wrestling. You you know when I do it by myself, I do it a little bit quicker uh, because there's not as much dialogue between myself and and TW. TW has something going on for work. Uh, He he has a project he's working on, and uh, I told him, You know, just take a break this week. When I take my third vacation of the year here in a month and a half, I'm going to need him to step in for me and fill in and do his thing. So only fair that uh, I get his back sometimes as well. If it's your first time here, consider becoming a valued subscriber of the Impact Lounge. Again, it is the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. Myself and TW and anyone who's done content on this channel, we are critics of Impact Wrestling. This is not a... I'm going to, you know, kiss your tits type of podcast. We're very critical, but we're huge supporters of the company. Everything we do is uh, is said with good intent and with uh, and wanting good things for Impact Wrestling. We're often taken as extremely negative, and that's fine if that's, you know, how you take us, but it isn't our intention. We are, you know, our intention is to just be real and honest, and uh, we're going to say what we like and say what we don't like. Simple as that. I'm not going to get too much into news. I'm not going to get into it at all, actually. I did an upload talking a little bit about Ace Austin and the Bullet Club thing. I did one talking about Morrissey, too. And I got to apologize to you guys. I know I'm always writing Impact for their technical difficulties, and then I turn around and I have them myself all the time. Uh, I guess the difference is I don't do this for a living, and I do it in my spare time, so I'm, I'm bound to mess up. The W. Morrissey upload that I did... Truly apologize. I didn't double check the sound levels. It was super, super quiet. It seemed like people were able to hear it well enough because I had plenty of comments. I did take that video down though because I deleted it before I could, you know, I couldn't go back in and fix the volume. So, fortunately, had to take that down, but I'm going to be doing my best to do a little bit more reaction stuff uh, with the news going on in Impact right now. So, let's let's just jump into this episode. You guys know I, uh, when it's just me solo, I don't like to, to um, Lolly gag too much. Let's get into this. Uh, first of all, good episode. I have felt that the last several were very easy to take in. They were very easy to watch, very easy to follow. The episode was over before you knew it, and that's always a good thing, especially watching wrestling. You know, like you're just watching something, and before you know it, it's the main event. So I, I felt that this episode, much like the last several, have been very, very easy to consume. Lots of we on the night on this episode. Lots of it. Uh, the last couple of weeks, it kind of felt like it was happening. And I, you know, here and there, I didn't really hear it that much. Uh, they they went all in. They they played catch up this time because they've been doing the uh, the TNA intros, which they're doing a really good job with them. Uh, so then they gotta they gotta pump it up with Wheel in the Night throughout the episode. But uh, it's a very solid episode. Uh, we're gonna get into the first match here. This was Savannah Evans versus Mia Yim. So it's a solid match, first of all. Uh, I'm not going to go move through move uh, with with any of that. Good match. Savannah Evans is looking a little bit better in the ring. Mia Yim, on the other hand, is looking like a seasoned ass veteran. You you compare what she's doing right now to the stuff she was doing as Jade. They are not the same person. So really enjoying uh, when she's on the screen. Really hope she sticks around for a while. She's done some, you know, podcast interviews and stuff. I know she hates to do podcasts, but I know she's done some interviews or at least one that I read where it seems like she has a lot of interest in sticking around long term. Not kind of like Morrissey's, like, I hope to be here and then leaves. I think Mia Yim's going to be here for a while. But this match here, along with another match that happened, we're going to get to that, did something that I've really been asking for. And it's taking a participant in a match and giving them a match prior to the pay-per-view to where they're building some momentum for themselves. It, it Oftentimes in wrestling, WWE was the first to do this, and they, they beat it to death. I'm sure they still do it. Uh, AEW wasn't, then they started doing it. Impact didn't used to, then they started doing it. What I'm getting at is when 
wrestler A and wrestler B are going to wrestle at the pay-per-view, they're going to wrestle like nine times before the pay-per-view. Or they're going to be in some kind of tag match or something to where they're constantly getting their hands on each other, you know, on free television. I've always had an issue with that. I've always said there's enough people on the roster that you can give, give them matches. They don't have to be squash matches, you know what I mean? But you can give them a match to where they're building momentum for themselves. I talk a lot about being old school, watching wrestling growing up as a kid. Uh, I don't know the age of a lot of you guys, but myself being 42, I grew up in an era where when a guy was on a pay-per-view, they were just racking up wins up to the pay-per-view. And then his opponent was racking up wins. They weren't, we never saw their mats being pinned. We never saw them touching a lot of the time, you know? So because that's how I grew up, that's what I, I want to see. That's just always what I want to see. So for me, Yim, this was a momentum match. Savannah Evans doesn't wrestle a whole heck of a lot on TV. Again, she's starting to look a lot better. But Mia Yim gets this win, and she's getting momentum heading into the pay-per-view. Not like last week, where I think it was might have been uh, Chelsea Green and jo Jordan Grace. There, there was one match between two of the girls. And then one of them takes a loss. How are we supposed to take them going seriously into the pay-per-view? You know what I mean? So that's an issue I have. I'm glad that they, they did this for Mia Yim. I'm really excited to see her use, eat, me, uh, excuse me, eat defeat as a finisher. I loved when Gail Kim did that. And I've also been saying over all these past podcasts over the last couple months, like, where's the cool finishers in Impact? And when Mia Yim made her return, she teased the package pile driver. And, of course, I got on right away. It was like, okay, Eric Young uses the pile driver. Sammy Callahan used. Sammy Callahan appeared the same exact show and hit the pile driver. It, it was the, like the same exact segment twice. Lights out, wrestler comes down, pile driver. Medium didn't hit hers, but, uh, you know, I'm always talking about wrestlers sharing multiple finishers in the company. And uh, she's obviously not using that right now. She's won all her moves with Eat Defeat. They said something on commentary. So, first of all, uh, Tom was doing this by himself. Matt Raywa had a match, so he just kind of had guests coming in, in and out. The commentary has been so good for Impact this year, guys. Um, it, it feels good for me to just enjoy the show and to listen to the commentary because I was getting on these podcasts and I was talking about Josh, I was talking about Madison, I was talking about Don Callis, I was talking about D'Lo, Stryker. Everyone was pissing me the fuck off. Not so much Madison Rain, but the other ones driving me absolutely nuts. And... Now I just enjoy the show. Like they're so good. They you know, they recap things. They're not uh, you know, reminding us every single time Moose comes down that he spent seven years in the National Football League. You you feel me on that? So he's doing an excellent job. And then he, you know, he did a lot of this by himself tonight too. You know, and he he really he really did his thing. But um to to go back to what I was saying, um actually I have no idea what I was saying. I started I completely Got off course. Oh, so on commentary, he mentioned that Mia Yim, when she was Jade, when she became Knockouts champion, that she defeated Gail Kim for the belt. Someone has to, I guess I could have Googled it. Someone get in the comments and talk to me. I, I don't remember that happen, I, happening. I don't remember them wrestling each other. When that Because Jade had that small push for a bit. She was a knockouts champion. If you guys remember, she actually wasn't on TV for like five or six weeks in a row. Uh, she was a horrible champion in that. Not her fault, but I mean, they didn't treat her like a serious champion when she won the belt. I thought she won it from Rosemary. I thought it was like a Monsters Ball match or something like that. So, I don't know. He said he won, she won it from Gail Kim. I don't, I don't recall that. I remember Gail Kim losing the belt to whoever she did and eventually getting it back at Bound for Glory 2017. And then retiring. Speaking of Bound for Glory 2017, if my work schedule ever slows down, uh, right now I've got like five days left on, I think, 14 or 15 in a row. So this is going on a couple years now where I keep thinking it's going to slow down and it doesn't. When it does, though, TW and I are going to be doing another podcast. We're talking about it where we're covering some past episodes or, or, or past one-night onlys or, or pay-per-views or whatever, but they're going to be from the Anthem era, maybe a little bit into the Pop TV 
Destination America stuff, but we're not going to go into like deep TNA stuff, AJ and Samoa Joe and all that. More stuff that's a little bit relevant to the current product. And what we want to do is we want to look at these, see how the company has changed for good and better over the last three, four years, you know, from then till now. Look at some of the wrestlers who we still see on the program or some who just recently departed or what they're doing now in AEW or WWE or something like that. TW wants us to do Bound for Glory 2017 first. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. That is the worst program, pay-per-view, TV show, whatever, of Impact that I've ever covered in the history of doing the Impact Lounge. I hated that pay-per-view. So when he said he wanted to do 2017, I was like, oh my God, I have to watch this again. Um, there was nothing good about that show. So... I don't know, but we're going to get into it. We're going to deep dive. Maybe I look back at it and I'm like, yo, this stuff was actually not that bad. I don't know. We'll look into it. But yeah, you guys got to refresh refresh my memory on that. I don't remember Mia Yim as Jade ever beating Gail Kim. Um, after that, there was a um, little bump in the hallway thing. You know, they like to bump each other in the hallway. It's a shark boy being confronted by Eddie Edwards. I don't know more. Um came in wildcat chris harris so he makes a return we'll talk about this here in a little bit when we get to it there's two slots in this match coming up for slammiversary honor no more versus impact originals i think that's what they're calling them i don't i don't think they're team impact people are like yo i want to see chris harris out there i I don't (laughs) i don't think he's in shape to wrestle you know what i mean so I, I I don't know. This, this segment was okay. Shark Boy is kind of funny. Um, and then there was something backstage with the influence and Rosemary. This was not good. I've been pretty critical of Decay. They lose, 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 lose. For some reason, Rosemary was mourning havoc as if she had passed away. And I don't know. She maybe I think I think I heard they're trying to start a family. Her and Sammy Callahan. Maybe she's hurt. I don't know. I don't think that it was a creative thing like, let's have have it get her ass kicked by Masha. That quickly. You know what I mean? Usually that's someone's hurt or this is their last match in the company type of thing. But Sammy's around. He just came back. I don't think she's going anywhere. But Rosemary was sitting on this ladder or something like mourning Havoc. Havoc's match with Masha Slamovich was like three minutes long. A week and a half ago on AEW, MJF took 10 power bombs from Warlow, went out on a stretcher, and within a week he was cutting a promo in the ring. Granted, he probably could have sold it a little bit, but my point is, from from <laughs> over the course of a week, you're going to tell me that just taking that snow plow that wasn't even hit that good and a little bit of offense during the match in a three minute time time frame that she can't be here this week, that she's out like she's in the hospital. She's you know what I'm saying? Like I, I don't understand <laughs> They they've done that over the years. Um uh, speaking of Bound for Glory 2017, they I remember they uh when they had to write Taryn Terrell out of the match. I think she got slapped by Gail Kim or something like that. And the next week they said, you know, due to the attack on Gail Kim, Taryn Terrell's out at Bound for Glory. I was like, she slapped her in the face. You know, so they, they have a history of this. You know what I mean? Just just flick someone in the forehead and uh, they cannot compete at the pay-per-view. But then you get, you know, one segment, you get your ass completely kicked and you're, you're back the next week. So I enjoy the influence a lot. I really, really like them. I don't think they're doing Decay versus them at Bound, uh, excuse me, at Slammiversary. I don't think that's where they're going with it. Someone, someone brought this up in a forum, and I think they hit the nail on the head. And I say, I, I say stuff like that a lot. I'm always like very confident in my predictions, and I'm wrong 99% of the time. But someone said something and hit the nail on the head, because Rosemary's wrestling to Neil Dashwood next week. It's likely not going to be very good. Uh, even though I like both of them. I, I'm not expecting much of a wrestling match. Rosemary's going to have a partner. 
she, someone is gonna gonna show up to be her partner to take on the influence of Slammiversary. I think Sue Young is gonna return. I think she's gonna come back and side with Rosemary. That's where I think they're going with it. Someone brought that up, uh, making a prediction, and I was like, dude, I think you hit the nail on the head because their her partner is gonna have to be someone kind of you know kind of returning. That's what's gonna make sense because. With Rosemary, you don't just have someone randomly run out and save her. You know, there has to be some kind of history there. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. They give her makeup of all things. I wasn't sure what that was about. Kenny King takes on Blake Christian. Kenny King's ultimate X spot is on the line. This is another thing I've been bringing up to where Dave Penzer, which I've learned to tune him out. I'm. It's clear they're not going to get rid of him. I don't think he's good anymore. I've learned to tune him out. But I did pick up in the middle, I'm excited in the middle, in the beginning, he says the following special challenge or special contest. That's what they've been doing. That's when that's when they have something that has stakes on the line. For they try to, you know, special match so that us at home know that there's something on the line. But of course the people in the arena have no idea what's going on. And Impact doesn't want spoilers getting out there, so they're not saying, hey, the following match is an X Division qualifier match or whatever it is. The problem with that is you've got Blake Christian, who's wrestled three matches in Impact. You wouldn't know him if you walked in up to him on a street. You know, he, he doesn't have a striking... He's real super talented, but he doesn't have these striking features where you're like, oh, that's Blake Christian. You feel me? So... You can't just bring him out in front of the live audience and have him just wrestle against Kenny King, who doesn't beat anybody. He did beat Chris Bay to get his spot. But that's the disconnect with the audience I'm talking about sometimes. Because the audience, even though they may have energy, it it always comes off fake because they don't know what they're cheering for and booing a lot of the time. They're just treating it like an indie show, just matches that they're enjoying. They don't know the stories. I've talked to multiple people from the, you know, went to the tapings, tapings before Rebellion. They said they couldn't tell you what the hell the Rebellion card was despite being there watching, watching the episodes. I thought Kenny King was going to lose this match and I was going to be very pissed off because I was glad he got into the match. It's like, yo, Kenny King can go. I like Kenny. Um, and, and you guys know I've been listening to me for a while. I'm a fan of the uh, the Bachelor franchise. He was on The Bachelor Red. He was on Bachelor in Paradise. You know, so I'm I'm, I'm a Kenny King guy. And uh, I thought when he put his spot on the line that he was going to lose it, and I was I was going to be pretty pissed. But he didn't lose. Kenny King won. This match was excellent. Uh, best match on the show. Really, really effing good. And just like the match with Mia Yim against Savannah Evans to kick it off, Kenny King gets a, a win that gives him momentum heading into the Ultimate X match. So that, that's what I like to see. It's so different than watching someone lose two or three times before the pay-per-view. We see that all the time. And a lot of the times they'll do that to the point that they telegraph who's going to win the match. I, Ace Austin's going to win this match. I mean, I, I already know that, but... You know, in the past, they'll they'll make it look like it's a two person match, and the other people are just happy to be there. They just they just show up and wrestle. You know, but the only story is like between two people. They're not really doing storyline stuff with this. Uh, Ace Austin's building it in his own way because he's doing the New Japan stuff. But to give Kenny King this victory gives him a little forward momentum. So I can dig it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Uh, they reveal that Jack Evans is going to be in the Ultimate X match. So, no qualifier. He's just, hey, this guy used to be in AEW, so that means he's better than everybody here. He just gets to enter the match. With that being said, I like Jack Evans a lot. I liked um, him and Angelico in AEW. I liked uh, them with, uh, um, the hell's her name? Why, I don't know why her name's escaping my mind. One of the, my favorite wrestlers in the world, Eva Lee's. Uh, when the three of them were in Lucha Underground together. When they were TH2, him and Angelico in AEW, they didn't beat anybody. Like, I could wrestle, me and TW could wrestle them and beat them, you know? And they were part of the AFO, 
the, well, the first ever H, HFO, which is the Hardy family office, and then the Andrade Hardy family office. Complete mess. Jobber stable, though. And uh, they always lost. He lost like a hair versus hair match to Orange Cassidy. And then I don't think we ever saw him on TV again. And it's weird because his partner's still there. But Jack Evans was released. I think he's super talented. I think he's a fun addition to this. I don't think he's going to win by any stretch of the imagination. But he's a, he's a good addition. So I like Jack Evans. They had this weird backstage segment with Raj Singh and Shira and Bupinder and Morrissey. Um, or it wasn't, they weren't in it, but they were, you know, it was after they beat him. So it had Morrissey and Bupinder in there, you know, and he's talking about, I got your back and this and this and this. And, you know, giving him advice saying, I don't remember what the advice was, something about, it's not bad to have someone watch your back. It almost seems like they're putting out a storyline there. You know, like we're going to see these guys team for a while. Definitely not what the hell happened, obviously, because he's gone. And I think that would have helped Bupinder quite a bit. But it was a weird segment because then, you know, PCOs and Morrissey yelling. Is PCO a baby face or a heel? You can't have him. Or is, I mean, do, do PSO, PS, PSO, PCO was on this episode like nine times he did this segment and then he comes out with honor no more to do a you know we'll get to that and a, a run-in where he's a 100 percent heel and then he shows up 10 minutes later for the main event as a baby face i don't know what the hell they're doing with him i don't know if he's like a tweener i don't think tweeners like the only tweener that ever worked was like stone cold steve austin and he still wasn't even a tweener he's still a freaking baby face but he was just a badass in a time where people were white meat baby faces. So now wrestling companies have been like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to create these tweener characters. Like, th It doesn't work for me. It seems like a lot of people enjoy PCO on social media. It doesn't work for me. I, 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 I'm not into it. They had uh, Rich Swan versus Matt, Matthew Raywald. Rich Swan's a digital media champion. The show that he defeated Matt Cardona. I think they dubbed in Penzer saying the digital media champion. It didn't sound supernatural. Uh, but then at the same time, Ray Wall was yelling at him, like, you're not the real digital media champion. And I'm just like, it, because obviously the match happened after the tapings, but it seemed like they were simpatico a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, I think they were, they were presenting the match as if when they recorded the match, I think they knew Rich Swan was going to be the champion. They had... Matt Ray Wall, or excuse me, Matt Cardona steal the belt from him, which made sense because Matt Cardona wasn't at the tapings, and Rich Swan can't just show up without a championship, so they, he he stole it, whatever. As I've mentioned, Rich Swan does not have social media, so it, it's not that the digital media champion has this duty and responsibility to be heavy on social media, but. When you're trying, when you call it the digital media championship and you're saying it's going to be defended on this platform and this and this, and then you're not doing that, and it's just really another mid card title, like that's what I'm not cool with. I love Rich Swan. You know, I, I would say he's my favorite wrestler in Impact. Uh, him and Moose are probably tied with, with uh, Steve Macklin, but I love Rich Swan. Best theme song in Impact. And I've, I've mentioned before, I don't actually care for too many of the Impact theme songs. I went through the roster page the other day looking at them, and I probably like, I mean, I was looking at the wrestlers. I'm like, what, what's their theme like? I probably like like 30% of them. I really don't like a lot of their themes. Rich Swans is absolute fire. Best one in the company, in my opinion. And you guys are going to have to drop some comments for me in, in, the, in the comment section. The episode where the, the gauntlet for gold happened, I'm still going to watch it because there's matches on there I want to watch. I really want to see Alicia team with Giselle. I just haven't had the opportunity to watch it. You guys got to backfill me. Why did Ray Walt eliminate Rich Swan from the gauntlet for gold? Like, Why did he get out of the commentary booth and, and eliminate him? I don't understand what that's about. I don't understand what this match, what the point of this match, other than... When they got Ray Walt to do commentary, they're like, well, we, we will let you wrestle every once in a while. I mean, is that what it is? Is that just like, 
you know, hey, we're going to pay you for this amount of wrestling dates every year, so you got to wrestle. So uh, someone's going to have to have to let me know. So, But I enjoy the match because I enjoy everything Rich Swan does. I think Rich Swan is incapable of a bad match. He's not going to wrestle Cardone at Slammiversary because he's hurt. So I don't know what they got for Rich Swan. But as TW, TW and I always talk about, former world champion, like you, yeah, you have to rehab him to some, to some extent to get him back into the main event scene. This is ridiculous. But this is a good start, digital media champion. Gia Miller was backstage with my girl, Alicia Edwards. So Alicia beats Renee Michelle at BTI. I was really excited because I was like, oh shit, Alicia Edwards is going to win a match. Like, hell yeah, finally, you know? Alicia's real finisher, I should say her real finisher, her finisher's always been a flatliner. She hits it clean like 10% of the time. And she uses a lot, she actually uses it on impact, but she doesn't beat it. Like no one, everyone kicks out of it. She doesn't beat anybody with it. So, you know, I've always said, like, yo, she needs, she needs a new finisher. Um, and she debuted a new neck breaker, which uh, I think she called it delicious or something along those lines. It was, I had to watch it a couple times. It looked a little awkward. I don't know if it was because of Renee or it was her. I don't know. It seemed like Renee's, Legs just bent the wrong way, and I don't know what it was, but I'm glad she's using a different finisher. I think she's too short for the finisher. With a neck breaker, you usually have to be about the size of your opponents. Actually, you know what? She's not as short as people think she is. She's just very petite, but if you put her to next to some of the other knockouts, she's actually not that, not that short, but uh, she knows better than I. If she feels that's her finisher, cool. I can get with it, but Gia interviews her backstage. And it showed a clip from BTI where Masha Slamovich gave her the envelope. And she's like, what's in the envelope? And she pulls it out. It's a picture of her with an X through it. And of course, the Alicia's is befuddled. Just, I, what could this possibly mean? Why is there a red X through this black and white photo of me? Uh, was it an accident? Uh, did she spill paint on it? Uh, you know, did her kid get a hold of it and just start drawing on it? I mean, she's absolutely no clue what it could mean. Uh, but then Giselle Shaw comes on, says, well, Masha's going to kill you. That doesn't really see, she didn't really deliver that in a way of someone that's like, you know, because they're, they're doing this, I got, I got your back, you got my back kind of thing. It was, it was almost heelish. It's almost like she's just denouncing her of being her friend or her partner. I think, Lady Frost was supposed to be the partner for Giselle Shaw. And, you know, clearly she's not at these tapings. I'm not sure what, why the reason is for that. And I think they just kind of had to replace Alicia, replace her and they threw Alicia Edwards in there. It works for me. I mean, they're my two favorite freaking knockouts. Uh, the wifey's right there. So I'm, I'm cool with it. But it was kind of a weird exchange between all parties involved. So Masha is going to be uh, defeating Alicia here pretty soon, pretty soon in, in pretty quick fashion. The Good Brothers had a segment. When are these guys' contracts up? This shit was awful. I stopped watching WWE right around the time they showed up. And I, I do recall on social media that, you know, several months into their run, People were like, they got the Bullet Club guys doing comedy and they're really bad segments and they blame it on WWE. They were like doctors and, and shit like that. Like, I, I kind of remember that kind of stuff. And people were blaming WWE's material. We get them an impact and everything they do, almost everything they do is awful. When they're serious, they're not bad, but the funny stuff is not effing funny. These guys are not funny. I've tried to listen to their podcast. I can't. It's not, I, it doesn't click for me. I like these guys' talents. Don't get me wrong. Like when they signed with Impact, I, I was about it. I was like, yo, let's, you know, let's inject some star power into the company. But I just feel like they've hijacked the tag team division. I feel that Impact is bent over backwards to make them happy. And they would, if they, if their little run in AEW was in complete shit and people, had they, they weren't getting go away heat, they, they'd be guaranteed going there. But I think, I, 
I bet there's actually a chance they return, that they're resigned. We're going to know what the outcome of the match with the Briscoes. That being said, this was not good. You know what? I'm going to pull that back. This was their best comedy segment they've done in Impact. I just didn't like it, but I can respect the fact that it is better, and I can see, I, I can recognize that it's better than the other stuff they've done. When they, you know, we're gonna. This this went on forever, and it was saying, you know, here's a top ten things we've done in Impact, not five, not three, ten. It reminded me of Meet the Parents where they ask Greg to pray, but he's Jewish, so he just has to make something up, and he's got his hands like this, and it's this long prayer where he's just dragging on. And then he's like, oh, Lord, three things we pray. You can see Robert Deere open his eyes like, are you freaking serious right now? That, that's where I got this, like 10 things we love about us. And when they got through the first five, I was like, what the hell is the other five going to be? Because those are all their biggest moments. And then it was the whole Briscoe thing. That I'm going to give them props for. That actually was good. That was, that was kind of funny. The Briscoes come out. These guys, despite just being on Ring of Honor and not being in AEW or WWE, they're amazing. Uh, with, with, they got chops. They're amazing on the mic. They're great talkers. They're great pro- promo. They can, they're believable. You know, the only thing that was kind of funny to me, not funny, but kind of weird, was that uh, they were kind of going on a little too long about the farm. To where, you know, you, you, you talking about us on the farm? Y- y'all don't know nothing about the farm. You wouldn't last 10 minutes on the farm. Ooh. You know, like, why, why are we using that as an insult? But, um, but that being said, they're very believable. They, they inject, like, real star power into the tag team division. This is the best tag team division they've had in a long time. And I just hope they utilize it the right way. And and the Briscoes just have all these great matches with the teams. Because when the Good Brothers came up board, it was a one-team division. They were squashing people. No one even looked like they were going to beat them. And they got really bland quickly. But with the Briscoes, I think they have competition. I think there's there's teams they can still have like really good matches with. And then you can, you know, pair some guys here or there. So um uh, this is not a match I'm looking forward to at Slammiversary because I don't look forward to anything of the Good Brothers, but uh, Briscoes are awesome, so, you know, I, I, I doubt I'll hate it. Um, Gia did something backstage with Josh Alexander, who to me is very, to Mary, uh, very dry. Scott Demore had to get on the show. You think I don't know that? Annoying motherfucker. Um, but Josh asked for a match with Joe Doring next week. He had a little run-in with Honor No More. They're getting their hands on each other entirely too much. Entirely too much. Most of the Impact Slam Aversary pay-per-views, the champions don't even wrestle in the build. You know, like they do they do a very good job of like keeping them and away from each other and doing some kind of like real build. This is just you know, there's been flashes of a good build because they're talking about Eric Young's history, but then there's, hey, we're gonna fight every week, which is which is not really my thing. He's gonna take on Joe Doring next week. I didn't know he was undefeated. I'm not the biggest Joe Doring fan. A lot of people seem to really like him. You know, I think he plays his role okay, but I'm I'm not like I'm not as excited for this match as as, as people have been on social media. But if it's good, it's good, and I'll and I'll say it's good. Mike Taven and Mike Mike Bennett, or excuse me, Matt Taven and woo Matt Taven and Mike Bennett took on Ethan Rhino. Uh, Lewis sent me a, a text <laughs> saying, "If Heath and Rhino win this, you might as well just be done with honor no more at this point." And I thought Heath and Rhino were going to win. No kidding, uh, because they you know they're they're teasing that these guys are going to get tag team gold at some point. I think we're past the point of them holding the belt, but I think Impact's going to give them the belts at some point. 
I hope it's not oh, taking him off the Briscoes or anything crazy like that. Excuse me, why cough? <coughs> Uh, this match was okay. I mean, I, I like OGK. They do they do good work. Well, I don't mind Heath, but the Heath and Rhino shtick is not my favorite part of the show. But but it, it was okay. Thank God OGK won the match because again they need some kind of momentum heading into the pay per view. They're going to be take on taking on Frankie Kazarian and the Motor City Machine Guns, and then there's going to be two more other people. So PCO's in this match. Heal PCO. Because they came over, you know, Honor No More came down after, you know, attacked these guys. Again, what the hell are they doing with him? Being a tweener doesn't mean be a baby face and then 10 minutes later be a heel and then be a baby face again. That was my big issue with Don Callis on commentary, if you guys remember. I always said his flip-flopping ass dude. Knockouts will come out. He's the biggest baby face in the world. Sammy Callahan come out. He's the biggest heel in the world. And then someone else will come in. He just go baby face. And he's just switching every match, every other match. So being a heel, you, I mean, being a tweener, you can get over to both sides of the audience. But it doesn't mean be a, you know, start wrestling for the pop one match and then the next one being trying to, you know, injure somebody. It's weird that W. Morrissey felt that, oh, uh, Pinder, I got this. I got, I got PCO. He's got my back. Of all the people in the company, I would not say PCO is the one that's got my back and, be, and feel confident with that because I don't know who he's going to be from episode to episode. Maybe it's because he's this whole Frankenstein thing. They're trying to do like a Dr. Jekyll thing. Maybe that's what they're trying to like put off, that he's this way one week and th- this way the next or, or his attitude changes throughout the night. It, it wouldn't shock me if that's what they think they're doing, but it does. It definitely doesn't come off that way, you know. I think whatever their their vision for him is, I think they have one. It's just not communicated well because I I don't know what the hell they're doing with him. But when Slammiversary comes around, there's two spots. <clears throat> I don't think Shark Boy's getting one of them. I'm not, I'm not concerned with that. People are asking for Chris Harris and James Storm. I don't want to see Chris Harris out there. I don't think he's in a wrestling shape. Uh, next week they're doing, <sighs> excuse me, I'm coughing my ass off now. Uh, three members from Honor No More against Motor City Machine Guns and Gazarian. You are pretty much giving us the match at this point. This is where I would rather see one of them wrestle Chris Harris and beat him in four minutes and continue the momentum. So now we got two sides fighting. One of them's going to lose and lose momentum. I actually, I'm not going to say that. There's this is going to be a no contest. I'm. I'm pretty confident in saying that and whoever the other partners are going to be are probably going to show up at this point people want america's most wanted i love james storm love 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 james storm i think he's made too many returns like you remember when madison rain made this this return this past one it was like uh, it got over like a fart in church because it was like madison's returning again you know james storm's made several returns so i i don't think it, it's not as like exciting to me at this point, but he's he's probably one of my favorite wrestlers in the world. So if it's him, I'll be happy with it. There's there's worse people they could they could use, but I would rather it see I'd rather see Christopher Daniels and James Storm be the ones instead of James Storm and uh, Chris Harris. You know, so we'll see. But I'm fairly certain with this match is going to tell us like whoever it's going to be is going to run down and help. I'm I'm pretty confident saying that. Shell, yeah. And uh, what we get after this? Um, sorry, I'm scrolling the Impact site here. Usually it says TW's thing. That it was the main event. Moose and Steve Macklin versus W. Morrissey and PCO. I don't know the point of this match. I guess it was to get Macklin a decisive win. You know, with Morrissey, who's departing the company. So at least he puts someone over on the way out. But I don't think that... I think he's done... Morrissey did a lot of good programs with Impact, but I don't think... He positions someone to take his place. You know, I feel that Jake something could have taken that role. But now they have nobody. Steve Backlund's a heel, so he can't just step into the W. Morrissey spot. 
But this was a good match because it featured two of my favorite wrestlers, Moose and Steve Macklin, so I'm not going to dislike anything they do. And then, of course, Morrissey just does great work every time he goes out there. Again, the PCO thing, I don't know if he's a heel or a babyface. You know, I feel like I couldn't hear, hear the, the, the crowd very well this episode. It seemed like they went back to some pretty old bad habits when it came to the editing. Um, if you guys, the, the, the Good Brothers segment when they were running down the top 10, I think number 10 was Slammiversary, their match, and the lighting from Slammiversary, and then it cut to the episode of Impact was night and day. Oh my God. I think it was like literal night and day, I think. I mean, it was, it was bright. We could see what was going on. And then it goes to the episode and just dark. And you can, you could barely even see the fans this episode. Like usually you can see a, a few rows, but you couldn't see anybody. It wasn't overly color corrected. It was just dark. And so I'll probably bring this, this up again when I'm talking to TW sometime, just cause I love to talk about the, the red. So my boys share a room. They have LED lights in there that my youngest one kind of likes for a nightlight, so to speak. You know, this lights up the room a little bit. My boys choose the color every other night. They, they go back and forth. My older son only chooses red. And my younger son gets really pissed at him when he chooses red. And they, it's a big fight every other night. Huge thorn in my side. One day I asked, my son, I'm like, Benji, why do you want red so bad? And he said, because it doesn't light up the room. He goes, we, we, I can put it on red and the room is still dark. Because he doesn't like all the lights on. Well, to our, my other son, he wants blue and green and, and, and these other colors because the room is completely lit up. And then I thought about, like, red just doesn't illuminate the, the arena. There's, there's almost nothing they can do. It almost seems, it only seems like when it's, they have a theme that is yellow or it's blue or it's green or whatever they're doing for the Impact Plus shows, that's when it just like seems to look better. But when it's all the red, it just, it's just dark and depressing. You can't see anything. It doesn't light anybody up uh, whatsoever. Uh, but going back to the main event, it was good for Macklin to get this. Macklin has been. He, he was on this real hot streak, and then he just started losing. And then he looks like he's going to win it, and then he goes back to losing. You know, so he needed this. He did a double arm DDT. It's another DDT on impact. Uh, I hope that that's not something he continues to use going forward. Um, I don't need another DDT on my screen. I really freaking don't. So I hope that's not what he's doing. But then again, he probably couldn't hit his real finisher on Morrissey just just due to how tall he is. So I hope that's all it was. But um, good win, decides to win, and Sammy Callahan comes out, does this thing with Moose. I don't know uh, what kind of match they're going to have at Slammiversary. I feel like it's not going to be a one-on-one -on -one match. I feel like at this point there's going to be some kind. I hope it's not a street fight or some nonsense like that. But with Moose injuring Sammy, you can't just go to Slammiversary and have a wrestling match, you know. So th there's going to be some sort of stipulation. I'm I'm, I'm fairly certain, um, even if it's a tables match. So we'll see. But but good episode, guys. Solid episode. Easy to consume. Easy to get through. You know, Tom tells a good story throughout the episode. He brings you back. Like at one point, he said, "You know, here's a room for the rules for the Queen of the Mountain match." Josh Matthews would have never done that. You know, so there, there's little things that he really adds to this show that really benefits it quite a bit. So I enjoyed it. Looking forward to Slammiversary. There's not a lot of buzz for the show. Let's let's be freaking real. Usually Slammiversary has been the one over the years that they have found a way to get people talking and a lot of chatter. But they, they're they not announcing a whole lot of matches. I think they've announced like five matches so far. And I think that's working. You know, I, I think you can get away with adding a couple of matches, you know, in the ninth inning. But when you just focus on your, hey, these are our five matches or whatever that we're really putting our effort into, I, I think it just, it's just, uh, you're not confused with what's on the pay-per-view. You're not confused with the card. You know, like the AEW pay-per-view they just had, I was like four or five hours long, whatever the hell. Like, there were so many matches announced. Like, I didn't even, when the time... By the day the pay-per-view came, I didn't even know what matches I was going to watch. 
that's how I felt. Like I knew CM Punk was wrestling for the title, but if someone was like run down the AEW card for me, I probably would have rattled off like four matches, five matches, and I'm like, I, I don't remember the rest because it was just a big jumbled, jumbled mess. Where Impact's promoting this, really, really focusing on a handful of matches instead of trying to create too many stories at once. And you know, again, there's you can throw a couple matches together at the last minute based on minor storylines going on in the show. You know, um, I don't think they will, but I mean, I'm saying you could do Masha and uh, Alicia having a match. You know what I mean? Uh, like maybe as a pre-show thing or something like that. But there's some stuff you could put together. But good episode, solid episode. Um, that's all I've got for you guys. I'm your boy BQ. Again, consider becoming a subscriber if it's your first time here. Thanks for riding with me on the solo tip. I will talk to you guys next time. And uh, myself and TW will be back in the saddle. Talk to you soon. Peace.